uh, welcome to today's uh, virtual program. We are so pleased uh, to see you all here today and uh, very excited uh, for our guest, Jeffrey Tenenhaus, who's joining us to share about his bicycle adventure on a city bike um, all across the United States. I'd, I'd like to welcome Jeffrey Tenenhaus to the program. He uh, is a is a friend of, of mine that uh, we met in in the the at a, a tourism indus, a industry event uh, in New York City uh, several years ago, uh, and then he decided to go on an exciting adventure uh, where <laughs> he's going to tell us about taking a city bike and then making his way out to California on a city bike, which now he's also recently published a book, which we can see here on the screen, West of Wheeling, How I Quit My Job, Broke the Law, and Bike to a Better Life. Um, so Jeffrey, if you'd like to, to come on and join us, um, and I guess, why don't we do a little bit of a, um, why don't we see in the chat, like if people have connections to some of the topics that we're gonna be talking about today. Um, so I guess first question might be, uh, how many people out there own a bicycle? Um, if you own a bicycle, if you could uh, put that put that into the chat or, uh, you know, uh, share with us if you're, you're a bicyclist uh, or if you've bicycled yourself a long distance, we'd be interested uh, to, to know about that, whether you yourself ha may have a similar story. Um, and then I guess the other question um, where we're going to end our tour today with Jeffrey is going to be Tulsa, Oklahoma, wondering how many of you have been to Tulsa, how many of you live in Tulsa, do you have connections there? Um, so please drop those into the chat so we can see um, who kind of shares common experiences uh, with Jeffrey. So Jeffrey, thank, thank you so much for making the time today. Um, can you share with us just for starters so people can get to know you? Um, why, why take a city bike uh, across the country? What was happening in your life at the time that you decide to do this? Thank you, Cindy. Uh, so yes, I am Jeffrey. I'm a native New Yorker. I was born in Manhattan. I grew up in Westchester County, and I found myself living in downtown Brooklyn and working in uh, Times Square area. And the best part of my job was the bike commute. So uh, I ended up uh, quitting the job and I kept commuting as the, the short version of a, of a longer story. Wow. Yeah. I mean, I, I remember uh, you were working in the event planning industry, right, uh, here in New York City. How long had you lived in New York City by the time you decided to take that city bike and, and leave across the country? About four. I was living in uh, downtown Brooklyn for about four, between four and five years. And over that time, I worked in two different corporate event planning agencies, both based in Times Square, and um, was really getting burned out from that high stress industry. Uh, New York is, is a high stress, exciting city. Um, and on the on the side, I had been doing tours. Um, I actually had uh, done worked on the double decker buses and was giving uh, walking tours on foot in Brooklyn and, and whatnot. And that's actually how I got into the corporate event industry. And that pretty much sucked all the life and enjoyment out of me. <laughs> and I found that the best part of my day was indeed on uh, on a bicycle, and I was a casual bike rider. I had my own bike, um, but when City Bike debuted uh, in like, 2013, I believe, um, I thought this was a this was great. I didn't have to take my bike out of my apartment and worry about it getting stolen, locked up on the street. Um, I could take these one way rentals uh, here and there, and that's what I ended up commuting. And it ended up being. The, the just the best part of my day was feeling in control of my my rhythm and my route and whereas when I got to work was kind of at a desk in the dark there was no natural light in this office the, the where I worked the, at least the second one and so that only increased my desire to be outside and on a bike where I felt in control of things and uh, sort of had a, a kind of a career crisis, realized that this event planning stuff was not going so well, um, had doubts about even if I wanted to be in New York, which was really all that I knew, and wondered what else was out there in the United States of America. I had not traveled very much within the US as an adult, 
And I had traveled a lot around New York City on a bicycle or city bike. And um, I just had this idea, crazy idea of what if, and that idea did not go away. And so for more than a year, I was thinking about this and I reached out to City Bike to try to get permission or sponsorship and try to do things, you know, the right way to see if they would let me do this. And the answer was no, uh, or we're going to ignore you. And eventually I just put all my stuff into storage. Uh, the lease on my apartment ran out. Uh, my job was coming to an end by mutual agreement. I had no reason left to be in, to be in New York. And um, I still had this idea. And I said, okay, let me uh, take this equipment that I, that I know and I like in New York and um, pay for it through my membership. So this was, I was an annual member. Uh, I undocked the bike on my credit card um, and then I did not return it, as you can see from behind me. Uh, and it was not like a taxi meter where the, the rate just keeps going up uh, the longer you go, but it maxes out after 24 hours. Um, I'm sure people have a question of how much that actually cost. Um, and in the fine print, uh, it was $1,200. It ended up being $1,200 plus New York State sales tax. So that was a little uh, extra that got me for that. Um, but the bike was uh, fully paid for it. Uh, there's a line in the book where I say that uh, City Bike took my money, so I bought their bike. That's the best way that I can describe it. Yeah. So um, I so, you know, bought it indirectly, but sure. uh, it was paid for um, and they did not uh, seem to want anything to do with me, not before the trip, not during the trip and not after the trip. So um, that is why I still have it because I, uh, I, I paid for it. Um, but at the time, I didn't really know how far I was going to get. I just wanted to see what else was out there. And, uh, and you end up uh, creating, uh, starting a blog called Country Bike with an I, so kind of playing off the city bike uh, name, which I thought was so creative. Um, you know, you're not alone in being a bicyclist who's traversed the country on this call right now. We actually have Peter, who is uh, tuning in from San Francisco, and he said he bicycled from New York City to San Francisco about 30 years ago and uh, retired from being the first bicycle pro program manager for San Francisco for 14 years. Um, we have, um, let's see, Sylvia, who said she uh, uh, biked cross country in 2000 um, from Washington to Maryland, 4,345 miles, um, and has also biked a 3,000 mile East Coast Greenway, um, but not all at the same time. Um, so that's that's really neat. So hopefully we'll get the chance. Uh, Peter also says he has connections to Westchester uh, in this part of the country um, and that he's visited Roger William Park. So we we have uh, people that like me who happen to have bicycles, use it to commute. I know during the pandemic, many of us have been on our bicycles much more frequently um, than normal. But could you take us through I, uh, where like what was your route? What what? What was the route? What cities did you go to along the way? Can you give us a sense of that? Sure. So actually, I was a, a casual cyclist, or I would say bicyclist. Um, I had never biked outside of New York City before. Um, and so when I did this, um, I was not at all prepared to bike long distances, but I had been a good uh, traveler, um, especially internationally. And so I approached this as a, as a, as a travel puzzle rather than a bicycling problem. Uh, and so I wasn't sure how far to get, I would get, but I broke it up into, into some stages, especially for the, uh, the first week and with a city bike, which weighs about 45 pounds and technically has three gears, uh, which in the book I call slow, slower and slowest. Um, I knew that I was not, I, I needed to avoid mountains and hills at all costs. Um, and that is much easier along the coastlines and along rivers. So uh, rivers do not go uh, uphill. <laughs> they are, they're flat, they're in a valley. So I would look for um, uh, roads uh, along rivers um, and particularly um, rail to trails, which we'll talk about in a little bit um, to, to find my way uh, west. But in the beginning, I actually went uh, directly south. Um, I put the bike on a ferry 
to uh, the Jersey Shore, the top of the Jersey Shore, because bicycling west out of Manhattan, if anybody has done it, um, is not an easy ride. Uh, you pretty much have to go over the, the George Washington Bridge, and then you get into some really um, unfriendly industrial areas, um, very congested, dense areas of, of New Jersey. So I was like, let me just skip ahead here. Uh, I'm not trying to set any kind of record. If I take a boat or a hitchhike here and there, I'm going to do it. I just got to keep going. So I put the, the bike on a boat and then began going down the, the, the Jersey Shore. And, um, but I did not know really where I was going. Um, I tried to plan it out a few days in, in advance. Uh, there is a, uh, a worldwide network for bicyclists. Uh, it's like couch surfing, but for people on long distance bike tours. Um, it has a, a, a funny name, it's called Warm Showers. Um, and that is like the couch surfing for bicyclists. And I was able to contact hosts along the way who um, would uh, agree to let me um, sleep over. That's great. And can we, uh, I think we have a map here so you can kind of walk us through. Uh, this is a map that shows some of the cities along the way. Um, and so this, this kind of highlights your route. I don't know if there's anything you want to say about uh, about the route itself, I guess this is, it's sort of incremental. So you're hearing from hosts who are in many cases, bicyclists themselves, who give you tips on where to go nearby. And that's kind of what's taking you along much of this journey. Is that right? That's right. Yeah. So I planned it, as you can see, it goes down South to Cape May. I made my way over to Washington, DC. Um, and then I followed a rail trail from DC to Pittsburgh. And we'll talk more about that in a bit. And then uh, there was another trail in, in parts of Ohio. Um, and then there was, I uh, just kind of kept going west, uh, finding the, the least trafficked, kind of safest, flattest roads possible uh, through Southern Indiana, Southern Illinois. Um, Missouri had a great rail trail that got me almost all the way across Missouri. Um, and then that's where things got kind of dicey. Uh, basically that Western half of the country um, was no fun on a bicycle. And if anyone has been cross country, they can probably relate to that. Even just driving through some of these uh, big box states, uh, there's not, you know, not, not a lot of excitement and there can be a lot of hills, certainly a lot of wind, but I followed uh, Route 66 from around Joplin, Missouri, all the way west to uh, Santa Monica, California. Uh, and that had been recently designated as, a, as a, a bicycle route by Adventure Cycling, which comes up with some of these long distance bike routes. Uh, however, it was uh, not a, it, it, was a, it was a rather uh, treacherous ride uh, on, uh, on a bike for some of these uh, parts of Route 66 don't have any shoulder. So I'm on a four lane highway next to semis in a traffic lane. Yeah, I mean, reading your book, it does seem like there are certain stretches where you're just being passed by these huge tractor trailers. And it's really some of these some of these roads you had to traverse in order to get get out west. Um, seemed like the kind of dicey situations. Um, we do want people to drop in their questions or their own stories into the chat. Um, we're trying to get the ball rolling with questions, but feel free uh, to put your questions in here. Andrew, who's producing behind the scenes today, uh, he has a question for you, which is, um, have you reached out to City Bike since they were acquired by Lyft? Do you think their attitude might have changed? That's a great question. Um, I don't know, I have not talked to them. Um, maybe I can mail them a copy of the, of the book. Um, but there may be, there certainly is a uh, new, uh, you know, corporate administration managing the, the city bike program, which has really flourished, um, in the, in the five years. And it's really wonderful to see all the places now you can go on the bike, uh, in, across, you know, in, in five borough, maybe it's not yet Staten Island, but they, they've got, I don't know, they're planning on it. Um, so it's, it would be worth my while to, to reach out to them. But, um, as of now I have not. Okay. There's also two other questions and then we'll move on to kind of discuss some of the people you met along the way, which is really central to the narrative and the, and the story you have to tell in the book. 
Um, Marilyn is curious, like, when did you do this? Which is just very <laughs> fundamental. And Peter is wondering, and I know people have asked this question a million times, it is a 45 pound bicycle. Um, what was the story in terms of your gear and how heavy was your gear? Um, and so the, the date, uh, like, when did you do this? And um, let's, let's hear a little bit about your gear. And maybe I can pull up a, a photo when you talk about the gear so we can show it. Great questions. So I left uh, the first week in August. It was a Friday. And um, so it was warm. It was hot. I didn't have to bring much stuff. Uh, I had a little uh, Travoy trailer that clipped onto the, the, the seat pole. Uh, and you'll see that in some of the pictures because the city bike does not, is not, it doesn't have the bolts for panniers or the saddlebags that typically go over the wheels for long distance cyclists. Um, I had to put a little, there it is. There's a little, uh, little trailer on the back. Um, and so I started in August and I ended up in Los Angeles in January. So it took about five months of non-continuous riding. Uh, by that, I mean, I wasn't trying to set any land speed records, especially not in this kind of bike. And I was ex most interested in exploring America um, to see what else was out there and um, to maybe find a new city to call home. Um, I, I mean, I love New York, but I just felt like I was kind of done with it and um, was ready for a fresh start somewhere else. And I wasn't sure where. So when I would get to some of those cities that you saw on the map, I would spend a couple of days and meet other cyclists. And it's a great community um, to be part of. People on two wheels have a, just a nice kinship. Um, and it's really easy to meet people when, um, you're, when you're biking, especially if you're biking on doing something like this. Um, so, uh, I did, it did take me, um, you know, five or so months. Um, and then in that trailer, I had a number of, you know, toiletries. Um, so just some simple clothing I bought, brought no bike tools. Uh, there are specialized parts on this bike that I knew I could not repair myself. So, uh, it was just a matter of like, I'll cross that bridge when I get to it. And if like, the bike can't be fixed, then I guess the ride is over. But let's see how long it takes me to get, you know, uh, a flat tire. Uh, the answer to that was about uh, 1,700 miles to Claremore, Oklahoma, uh, not far from where I'm currently broadcasting from, uh, is where I got my one and only flat tire. And sure enough, uh, any bike shop can actually repair a, a city bike with some uh, with some with some specialized tools. So um, by the time I got to Washington, D.C., I met a really friendly bike shop owner, uh, coincidentally called City Bikes, uh, but C-I-T-Y Bikes. Uh, and so they gave me uh, that seat that you see there. They swapped out the seat. They gave me better pedals, one of which had already been cracking from the original equipment. Um, so and that that lasted me all the all the way. The seat, the pedals. I did have to change the tires out in Amarillo, Texas, um, but you know, one one flat tire and uh, some friendly bike shops along the way got me through. Oh, that's that's great. Um, so, I can I just to clarify. So this this was about five years ago, right? It was tw was it twenty fifteen to, to into twenty sixteen? Yeah, now it's about six years. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Great. And, and, you know, in the book, you describe uh, many of these people that you stayed with, the bicycle repair shop, the people that you met in bars and restaurants and just out on the streets, uh, on farms, all different kinds of places. Um, could, are there, I, I know there were a lot of people that were generous with their time and, and were super kind and giving. And I'm just wondering if you have any stories uh, that you love to tell about any people that you met along the way who, where you were just astonished by their generosity. Sure, a great example of that. So I uh, would try to stay with hosts that I would find on the warm shower site. Um, if I could not find that and it was uh, warm enough weather and there were campsites, I would do some camping, especially along the rail to trails. Um, there were a lot of uh, free or low cost campsites, which were, which were great. Um, and then if I couldn't find a campsite or a host, then I would stay at like a B and B or, uh, or sort of the, the cheapest, least sketchy motel, which was probably a motel six. Um, and, and there was one night where I just, uh, 
wild camp that's in the book in, in Indiana. I didn't have permission. It wasn't a campsite. I was just going to roll the dice and see what happens if I just sleep out on the, uh, uh, on the street. But um, when I was first setting out, I did plan it in advance, and I was shocked by the hospitality and generosity and trust of uh, fellow Americans, and this was just next door in New Jersey. Um, you know, as a New Yorker, I was always suspicious about things and, you know, people approach me and I always have my guard on high. And the first night I contacted somebody to stay in La Valette, New Jersey, they weren't going to be home, but gave me permission to camp in their backyard. And they had a uh, solar powered shower, which was great after a very uh, nervous first day of riding on a, on a city bike. Uh, doing all these things that I probably wasn't supposed to be doing, but was going to do it anyway. Um, so that was nice to just have a place to to crash and have a uh, have a, a warm shower, solar powered shower. Um, and then it got more interesting the second night in Manahawkin, New Jersey. Uh, I stayed in somebody's house inside the house, and they weren't home. They literally left the key under a flower pot kind of thing. Actually, their one of their adult sons was home and let me in um, and showed me all around the house. Let, said you could sleep anywhere you want, use any of the bathrooms, whatever you want to do, eat all the food in the fridge. And I was like, is this normal? Like, can I just maybe maybe I don't need to like have another job and I can just, you know, bum around and keep, uh, you know, staying with people and, and being fed by their generosity. So uh, I stayed with uh, someone, you know, at a house, nobody was home. Um, and then the, the, there was a third night I stayed in a, uh, I couldn't find anybody in Atlantic City. Uh, so I stayed in a, uh, a motel, even the Motel 6 there was too expensive. So I'd stay in a motel above a shop uh, that was cash for gold. So sometimes the, uh, you know, had to find the, the cheapest place to sleep. Um, but then the last night in Cape May, New Jersey was, um, the, the high point of the Jersey Shore because there uh, the host uh, family was home and they were they cooked me a wonderful Garden State feast of all these fresh, uh, uh, fresh, uh, fresh fruits and vegetables and uh, there they are on the left uh, that's Carol and Mark and their friends in the middle um, and they were cyclists as well and um, they just showed me a great time. I ended up spending two nights with them. Again, I wasn't quite in a rush and their hospitality was really wonderful. And uh, we got along really well and I remain in contact with them. <laughs> so uh, some of the nicest, most, Peter says some of the nicest, most friendly and helpful strangers uh, I ever met were on my bicycle tours. Um, and it, it seems like seems like that's the same with you. Um, now, we do have people here, I'm sure, who have some of their own recommendations. Uh, I see Sylvia here uh, mentioned the website Rails to Trails, um, which uh, is, is, is an excellent, excellent resource for people that are um, interested. She said it's, it's a great American trail project, connects trails from Washington, D.C. to Washington State. Um, and she also mentions traillink.com as a great resource. Um, for you, but based on your experience of where you bicycled across the country, um, if you were to recommend some of us do portions of your trip, which for you were real highlights? Sure, and I think we have some uh, photos of these rail to trails, and that's a great resource. Thank you, Sylvia, for, mm -hmm. for pointing that out. Um, before that, I, again, I hadn't really biked outside of New York, so I didn't really know what a rail to trail was. Um, but I was very thankful that they existed. And there is a, uh, there are two rail to trails uh, that connect seamlessly from Washington DC to Pittsburgh. And that helped me avoid the um, Appalachian mountains in, in uh, Pennsylvania, which are no fun on a, on a bicycle. So it starts out here on this, uh, this is called the, the CNO Canal uh, Trail. And that was a bit uh, kind of, bit overgrown. It was, it was a very natural trail. Um, so actually the, uh, the, the, the city bike, this was the first time where I was like, you know what, the city bike is actually a great touring bike on this, this kind of larger gravel, uneven uh, paths with roots and rocks and things like that. Um, kind of just making my way across the, the landscape here. And in the book, I describe um, the history of the CNO and then sort of what that was about. But as it goes up 
along the Potomac River. Um, it goes through lots of historical sites, including Harper's Ferry, um, where I spent two nights. And I really got to um, rediscover an American history that I had learned in high school, but kind of forgot about. And now was, was living it by going to these different trail towns and reading all the signage along the way. So the CNO Canal goes from, this trail goes from, um, from Georgetown in Washington, DC to Western Maryland, where you can pick up the Great Allegheny Passage, which goes 150 miles to Pittsburgh. So the, and the, the Gap Trail, as it's called, the Great, Get, Great Allegheny Passage um, is much more of a, a manicured trail. In my book, I describe it kind of like a, like a golf course. Um, you can see here, it's, it's, it's just uh, has, uh, you know, the nice mowing on the sides, it's a level uh, crushed limestone rock path. And, uh, and it's just, it's a really nice, easy ride. Um, but, you know, if I, I was able to do both of these on a city bike, so um, I think uh, if you have your own bike, maybe not a road bike, but um, a, a touring bike will certainly get you through it. And that together is 235 miles um, through uh, the through landscapes like this. Um, and this was in uh, this was in uh, Western Pennsylvania on the way to to Pittsburgh. So some really scenic uh, paths without cars, pretty much without hills because it's along rivers, and some really nice riding campsites. Uh, you can stay with. With, with hosts, if you can find one, um, just really nice to commune with nature and and get out of the uh, break break the cycle of, of your of your daily life. Um, Sylvia and Peter have both done the Great Allegheny Passage as well, uh, and said that they loved it. Um, and Peter also commented he he did the CNO Canal Towpath um, and, as well as the Gap and said that he read all the interpretive signage, which we also know you did that too. Um, you learn a lot about the country, just your past. Where am I? What is this? Like, <laughs> so that's, that's really neat. Um, are there any other trails that were highlights for you that you, um, yeah. There's um, another slide for the Ohio to Erie Trail. Uh, so that goes from Lake Erie, uh, up, you can see the, the, the outline there from you know, Cleveland down to Cincinnati. So I didn't take that whole, Path, but I took some of it down to Cincinnati, which is a wonderful city. And shout out to my cousin Michelle. I believe she's on this call. Thank you for your hospitality in Cincinnati, uh, which is actually one of the cities that I ended up liking so much. I considered uh, moving there along with Pittsburgh. Michelle says hi. She's happy to be here. <laughs> uh, so that and that trail, at least the segment that I went on, was paved. That that was paradise. I mean, it was flat. And it was paved. There's nothing a cyclist can ask for more um, with a for a uh, no cars, flat, and a paved trail. So uh, that was a very nice trail. I, I guess that that if, if there's anybody again, please drop in your questions. Um, can we go back to how heavy the? I, I mean, I know it probably varied at different points in time, but but how heavy of a load were you carrying with you? The answer is I don't know. <laughs> um, but what I was told from warm showers hosts who had hosted other cyclists that I was traveling very light, um, so that they picked up that, that little trailer. And, um, I, so I would say it was under 40 pounds. It, the bike was heavier than the, than the trailer. Um, so I was traveling pretty light because when you don't pack any tools or anything, I didn't have any cookware or stuff like that. Uh, I guess you can travel light. And this is a picture from the uh, Ohio to Erie Trail on the way to Cincinnati. And I also, probably my favorite trail was the Katy Trail. And uh, this, you can see, runs along the Missouri River uh, from just outside St. Louis to uh, Western Missouri. I think now there's a, a, a spoke of it that actually goes directly to Kansas City, uh, which was not available at the time that I was biking. Um, but you can traverse the, the width of Missouri on a trail like this, pretty much next to the river. Um, it's flat, lots of great campsites and uh, small towns. This is um, Boone country. Uh, Daniel Boone um, passed by some uh, of his landmarks and um, also the Lewis and Clark Trail passed alongside uh, the, the Missouri River. So I was reading plenty of uh, signage about that. And uh, the chapter about the Katy Trail in my book 
is um, sort of like the probably the biggest feel good chapter. Uh, that was like that was a high point. It was early October. There was just a little bit of uh, color in the foliage, and uh, the trail was just great riding. I was now halfway across America. Like, what could go wrong? Um, and I even thought about maybe biking back to New York once I got to California. Um, but after after the Katy Trail, things went um, downhill. And by downhill, I mean uphill. <laughs> Um, now, there is a place on the Katy Trail that you, a town that you stopped into, right? Um, we have this image here of a, of a concert hall. Um, where, where are you at in, in, this, in so this image? This is a, a little German town called Herman, two ends, uh, Herman, Missouri. It's about an hour west of St. Louis in a, in a car. It might take you about a, a day to bike there. And this is right on the trail. And this was founded as a, as a second fatherland for German immigrants uh, who uh, some of the, their, uh, you know, the immigrant leaders in, 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 on the East Coast, especially Philadelphia, were worried that the German immigrants were getting too assimilated to the American ways and wanted to preserve their culture um, away from the East Coast. So they found um, this site along the Missouri River that reminded them of the, uh, of the Rhine in, in, in Germany, and they established all of these um, little uh, institutions and bake shops and breweries and um, beer halls and uh, guest houses and everything like that. So this is like a little German town uh, in, in, in Missouri, and it was a great time. I thought about spending a second night there, but I really did have to keep going. Uh, but that was a really unexpected find and wasn't even in my original plan. So that's in the, in the chapter about the, the Katy Trail of how I discovered Herman and uh, all the, the great things I ate there. So Peter is, is uh, wondering where the best place is to order your book. And Andrew just dropped a link into the chat in case anyone wants to check that out. Um, and I hope you do. Uh, I, I read it on my vacation this summer and it was a a real pleasure to, to just go on this journey with you. Um, even though we were following you on Instagram and also all the press that was coming out about your trip. Um, and so I, I wanted to, and speaking of slowing you down, so you just mentioned that you didn't want to stay an extra night, but I know also that as the trip went on, you were getting more and more visibility and press. Uh, we have this slide here. I don't know if there's anything you want to share about your experience of engaging with the press as part of this whole adventure. Yeah, I think uh, some people criticize me for uh, sort of this attention seeking uh, trek, um, when in fact, actually, I really uh, didn't quite welcome the, the, the press as it really slowed me down, having to, you know, set up interviews, email photos, put things together. Um, and there were times when I was like, you know, I've got to get to somewhere before the sun sets. And I've got to stop and answer uh, your questions. Actually, that picture from before where the bike was in the woods with all those straight uh, tree trunks was one such time when the New York Post got a hold of me. Um, and they, that was the first piece of press to come was that Ride On Man article. Um, and it ended up being very favorable, but I was quite worried uh, about that. Uh, yeah, right, right around there when I had one one bar on my cell phone and this reporter wants to have a converse 45 minute conversation i'm like that's that's a precious hour of my time um but the for those of you in new york know that the new york post is not particularly uh, bicycle friendly and i was very worried about the uh the coverage i would get from them and the only assurance i got from the reporter was that she said it would not be running in the crime section so uh, sure enough, it was actually very nice uh, coverage, and that created a lot of other coverage as well. Um, and so it was it was fine, um, but I didn't, you know, I wasn't looking for for headlines and media and stuff like that. But it did find me at certain points in the in the journey. Um, this is this is kind of going back to this is just a sweet story that Peter uh, shared from his adventures and and connecting with people along the way. Um, bicycling across the country. He says, a friend I met on a group bicycle tour was ahead of me and left a note on a state historical marker just off the road because he knew I would pull off the road to read the sign. <laughs> I think that's that's great. I mean, you you met other bicyclists. Uh, there was a, a young woman from Korea. Is that right? 
uh, who, who biked with you part of the way? Yeah, probably the, the most impressive uh, cyclist I met along the way was a, a young Korean woman uh, who uh, it turns out just had graduated high school and was biking across the United States. And I met up with her, you know, I, I overtook her. Uh, she was actually traveling more slowly than I was. And um, in, I guess it was the day that I was crossing from Oklahoma into Texas. Uh, so kind of the middle of nowhere up there and was just floored at that she was doing this by herself, that she was so, so young. English was not her native language. And, um, and, and in the book, I, she, she should write her own book. Um, but she also was, was uh, doing some camping and would actually go and um, knock on people and see her camp in, in their front yard uh, who, who made it across the US uh, even braver than, than what I was doing. Um, Jeffrey, for just a second there, you broke up. I just wanted to kind of, so she was knocking on people's doors and then asking if she could stay in their yards, right? Or on their property. Yes, yes that's correct. Wow, unbelievable. Um, yeah, Peter also says that he had a lot of local press that he was interacting with. Um, and it was, a, it was an AIDS fundraiser called Cycle for Life, um, which I'm sure you encountered some people that were also doing charity rides or... We're familiar with, is that something you would want? Would you want to bicycle across the country again? Uh, I don't think so. Um, maybe some of these rail to trails. Um, so I mentioned the ones that I was on, but since that time, the Empire Trail in New York um, now offers 750 miles of, of, of trails. I believe there's one that goes from Manhattan up to the border of Canada and then another spur from Albany to Buffalo. Um, so like doing something like that would be really cool. Um, but I don't quite have the appetite to, to travel long distances on roads that are used by cars. And maybe, maybe not on a city bike. I don't know. I, I'm just a guess. I don't know. Maybe um, there is someone here who asked whether you consider yourself a cyclist now after this whole adventure. No, I really consider myself a, a bicyclist. Um, I never, you know, I don't, uh, I don't ride for, for speed or for distance. Um, I now, I am true to my brand um, and I've been living in Oklahoma now for five years. I do not own a car. Um, so I only get around by, by bicycle, not the city bike that is used for, for ceremonial purposes only. Um, but I have a, a road bike. Um, actually, it's the same one that I started out on when I uh, got it under the, the BQE. Uh, about 10 years ago when I transitioned, when I was leaving my first event job, I was quitting without any backup and I had to like slash my, my budget. And the first thing to go was that monthly Metro card. And that's how I ended up on a, a bike to begin with. I said, let me get rid of this. Uh, I think it was $104 at the time. And, uh, and, uh, and I bought a, a used bike for about $300 from a shop under the, the BQE. And um, I still have it. It's actually right around the the corner from me there. And that's how I, that's how I get around here. So we have, uh, I think uh, Janice is how you pronounce the name. Who is Jane on the map? I'm going to pull up the map so we can have a visual reference here. So Jane is that Korean cyclist that I just mentioned, who was uh, riding by herself between high school and, and college and knocking on the, the, the doors of strangers to see if she could camp in their, in their yards. Um, and she was also, I remember the day we were supposed to ride out, um, she said that she couldn't ride. I was trying to get it you know, early, maybe 9 a.m. She said it was a Sunday. She said she had to go to church. So not only was she uh, biking across the country, but she was um, you know, being, you know, doing her, her daily routine as well on the road, which I found very impressive. So Jeffrey, we have um, a few uh, photos to share just from the, the rest of your, your journey. And then, and then you're gonna take us on a little tour of your offer, office and um, tell us about your, your tour company in Tulsa, Oklahoma and how you ended up there. Um, let me pull up these photos and you can kind of walk us through um, these, these last few photos of your journey here. So um, here you are entering Kansas, is that, is that correct? 
Uh, actually, it, it would appear that I'm actually leaving Kansas, but that's where the <laughs> sign. <laughs> so I'm technically in uh, Oklahoma, but looking back to Kansas, which I was there just for uh, for lunch. That was kind of a satisfying state. I only, I don't know, maybe went 10 miles through Kansas. Route 66 is just clips the one corner of of Kansas. So I mentioned the rail to trails that I started on the, the sort of the eastern half of the U.S. I joined up with Route 66 in um, Joplin, southwestern Missouri, and I entered Kansas, had a pretty good barbecue lunch, and then I ended up uh, a few days later in, in Tulsa, uh, continuing down Route 66. And Tulsa kind of steals your heart as we're gonna, as we're gonna hear. <laughs> <laughs> momentarily. Um, so then that led into Texas. So that's where I met Jane the day I was leaving uh, Oklahoma and we rode into uh, to Texas together. So I believe she probably took this photo. Uh, eventually uh, I made it to Santa Fe in New Mexico, uh, which, was a, which was a wonderful city. Um, and by now it was early November and at that high altitude, it actually did snow five inches, um, which was just reason for me to stay even longer. Again, I was not in a rush. Um, and then I biked from Santa Fe down to New Mexico, uh, down to Albuquerque, and then entered Arizona, where it got also colder and more snow. Uh, took a detour to the, uh, the Grand Canyon. And then, yes, so this is in Williams, Arizona, which is just south of the Grand Canyon, another great Route 66 city. Um, it snowed on me there as well, and I had to wait an extra night until it cleared. Yeah, those, that, that seems to be the tough point for you. And there was also just like finding, there was a, a night when you had to, you just couldn't find a place to stay and it was cold. You ended up sleeping outside in your tent. Um, yeah. <laughs> I'm sure many of the people with us can, can identify. Um, I wonder, uh, I want, so Andrew wonders, is, is this the only city bike that's ever been to the Grand Canyon? Probably so. Yeah, gotta say, yeah, I, I would bet some money on that. Oh. And so eventually I do make it to, um, to California, um, to uh, Los Angeles, and I'm able to meet up with lots of um, cool bike people there who are into alternative transportation, like bikes and bike sharing. And in Santa Monica, there was a bike sharing program at the time called Breeze. And they had it, we organized a, a group ride uh, to the pier in Santa Monica. So this is the, uh, the, the happy finish um, and that a lot of other people got to uh, kind of join for the last day on a group ride. And the, uh, thus the sun set on this city bike adventure. And so now you're, you've, you've um, made your way, whoop, sorry. You've made your way, here you are in, in Tulsa, which is now, now where you're living. Um, and could you tell us like what, how did you, what brought you to Tulsa? And I know you had highs and lows uh, in Oklahoma. So could you speak to us about how you came to really love, love that city and connect with the people there? Sure, so I passed through here because it was on the way on Route 66 and, um, I immediately noticed that there was a historic downtown with uh, some several skyscrapers um, and also noticed that there weren't any um, people downtown like walking around. And having been from uh, New York where there are also you know, uh, historic buildings but lots of people, I was kind of wondering what happened here that there was some kind of history and then uh, the city was really struggling uh, to reinvent itself unlike some of the um, other cities that had rebounded from their um, kind of the exodus from the downtown, like Pittsburgh, Cincinnati, Louisville, have all had a uh, downtown renaissance. Um, and that just hadn't happened in, in Tulsa. And I thought that, you know, after finishing my journey and wanting to start somewhere new, that this was a city that was really um, thirsty for ideas, was welcoming people um, to come and try to make an impact in the city. And ultimately that's what I was looking for was just a, a smaller city, a smaller community, uh, one where I, would, where, where I would know people or they would recognize me and, um, but also have that, that city vibe. And so it seemed that Tulsa was, was trying to grow um, and they needed some help. And I thought, hey, you know, I'm trying to make a, a new start. Maybe this would be a good place. And ultimately it was the really, uh, the friendly people 
uh, here in, in Oklahoma, the ones that I, that I met and interacted with um, that helped convince me that this was a, a, a good place to, to start out. And um, yeah, and in the book, the last chapter kind of mentioned some of the, the struggles I had hitting the ground here. It wasn't all sunshine and rainbows, um, but eventually, um, um, partly thanks to the pandemic actually, um, uh, helped uh, after another, after losing my full-time job at the beginning of the pandemic, I was able to then pivot to some personal projects, including writing the book, um, which I had been working on for past couple of years, but really then had the, the time to, to finish it, um, as well as starting a tour company, which I had, uh, had dabbled in on, uh, through Airbnb just a little bit. Um, and then the pandemic came, people stopped traveling, um, but on the, uh, about, a, about a year ago or so, um, people were beginning to travel and I had worked on my website and then started to put myself out there and then was getting um, people to book tours with me because um, even though you may not think many people go to Tulsa, Oklahoma, there is, uh, you know, people do come here for, for weddings or um, business meetings or they're, they're traveling through on Route 66. Um, and there just wasn't much competition. There is uh, one lady that does tours. She wears cowboy boots. Um, I don't. So you can, if you want that vibe, you can go with her. If you want uh, a vibe from someone who has been in a, uh, in a, in a bigger city like New York and kind of uh, process the difference of what people get here, often from bigger cities, they're like, what, what's going on here? Like, where are all the people? And why are there historic looking buildings here? Uh, well, 100 years ago, Tulsa was one of the most important cities in the world, the oil capital, uh, uh, and um, there, was, there was money flowing through here like we can't imagine, and the uh, oil barons and philanthropists built cultural institutions and, uh, and office buildings uh, to uh, create, you know, turn a, a cow town into an oil capital within 20 years, so there's a lot of history here. Um, also, uh, uh, shameful history. Uh, 100 years ago, the worst racial violence in, in the nation's history uh, happened in Greenwood, which is just across the tracks uh, in downtown. Uh, it was a thriving African American neighborhood that was um, uh, burned and looted um, by uh, white mob and white law enforcement in the Tulsa race massacre. So that has also put the city on the map um, and people are traveling here to learn more about that. Um, but there was just a lot of, there was opportunity here to, to start a business. I like tourism. I used to do it in New York. Uh, that's how I know Cindy. And um, I thought, you know, you know, maybe I can put my own spin on things and opened up this office that you see behind me uh, starting in December. I got a great deal from the landlord. It was a pandemic special. Um, you can't tell from right now, but in a moment, uh, we'll go outside. And this is, uh, this face is, a, um, the, one of the main commercial streets in downtown Tulsa, uh, South Boston Avenue, kind of like the Broadway of, of Tulsa where all the important skyscrapers were built. And I have a, a storefront um, in an historic art deco building that was built in, uh, that opened in 1931. And um, right across is a, is a little coffee shop on the other side. And, um, and so here I am like in the middle of it, uh, and have this opportunity and the space had been vacant for a while. And there are many other storefronts that are vacant even in the downtown here. So um, if you have a great business idea and you're looking for somewhere to do it, um, you can check out uh, Tulsa and they will even pay you $10,000 to move here. Um, that's a program called Tulsa Remote. And I did not get that money as it did not exist by the time, but at the time that I came here, which I predated that that program, so um, the city is trying to attract more uh, more diversity, more ideas, more entrepreneurs. Um, but it it's the place where there is um, opportunity, and even as someone as as an outsider, I didn't have much money saved up when I when I arrived here. That eventually I was able to um, to start this little uh, little tour company. Cool. That is, that is so great. Yeah. I, um, so are, we're going to take a little tour. Sylvia did ask about Art Deco and whether there are Art Deco buildings in Tulsa and we're going to get a chance to see one of them. Um, yep, so do you want to switch over to your other device? 
um, so that we can take a look around your office. Jeffrey, we're jealous. I really love, I mean, having an office like that is such a luxury. It's something Turnstile Tours, we at Turnstile Tours dream of. <laughs> okay. So we're gonna take a look at your office. You have a lot of uh, Oklahoma and Tulsa ephemera. Wow. And do you live, do you live nearby and do you ride your bicycle to work? I do, yes. <laughs> and do people I know, just- Yes, I know, uh, I know some of the people on the uh, chat there. Yeah, Nate just said, uh, great seeing your office. Uh, though I'm back in my hometown of Philly, I lived in Tulsa for a few years after riding halfway across the country on a charity bike trip. And he enjoyed the city so much too. Um, uh, this is great. Some of these old postcards. This so might- yeah, yeah. You can see that it is the, uh, the oil capital of the world. They were very proud of that. We have a few minutes here. So we're gonna kind of take a peek at some more of this ephemera and then step outside. Yeah, there was a question of uh, if Tulsa has good Art Deco, and the answer is yes, uh, because Art Deco was becoming fashionable as Tulsa was growing up. So I'll take you to the main uh, street here, and I will be able to stand in the middle of it because there's no traffic. Uh, way down there is the Boston Avenue Methodist Church, built in 1929. And then actually at the north end is a building that uh, was done by the same architect, Minoru Yamasaki, who did the original Twin Towers. That's a half height uh, model and about a quarter the width. And here is the building. This is called the, the Philcade. And this is an Art Deco building from 1931 built by oil man, Wade Phillips, uh, whose older brothers founded Phillips 66. This is a coffee shop. And, then and you have, a, you have a showcase right there too of your, where you market your services uh, for people that are heading into the building. Yep, so here is, so the coffee shop is right here. Uh -huh. have, Tulsa, has a, Tulsa has a good local uh, coffee scene, I have to say that. And, uh, and then right across the way is uh, this little office. You're all welcome to come visit, take a tour. And if we just have a moment, I will take you inside the uh, Philcade. This was built to be Tulsa's first shopping mall. It was an office building. Um, and the Art Deco in here is a, is a zigzag style. This is the first Art Deco period. Um, it's very geometric and vertical. And the ceiling also has some native uh, Osage tribe motifs and the uh, sort of that border, the, uh, the, the triangles there. And we have, a, we have a question here, which is um, what kinds of things are people tend to be interested in when they come to Tulsa? Do you do a lot of architecture tours or do you do any on a bicycle? Are they mostly walking tours? Yes, I do. Uh, they're all walking tours. Uh, I do have an architecture and art deco uh, tour that starts here in the, in the Philcade. Um, I do some downtown history tours. There's a tunnel tour that, uh, goes underneath some of the office buildings. Oh. I, I can do a tour of, uh, of Greenwood. Um, I tend to refer those to Greenwood-based uh, organizations. So yeah, this is the, uh, the Phil K. These were, all, these were once all little uh, storefronts, little shopping mall. 
Wow. Wow. So, so Jeffrey, um, it's been really neat to see inside of this building. What is this building called? The Phil K. P. H. R. Ala. Right here. Okay. Um, it's. Aha. <laughs> uh -huh. The uh, so Phil for Phillips. Wait, Phillips was the man's name, uh, the oil man who built it, and. Cade comes from Arcade, an old time word for, for shopping mall. And he mm -hmm. actually um, is an office building and he later built a penthouse on the uh, top of this building. And a uh, couple uh, now lives there, a different couple lives there. So. We're having a, a request here to have you do some virtual tours for us for Turnstile Tours, <laughs> which we would love to collaborate on. That's a great idea, Peter. Um, so Jeffrey, would it be possible for you to turn your camera around so we can see your face? Um, and we can also go into gallery view in case there's anybody that would like to share themselves. We're kind of wrapping up and we can open it up if anybody wants to turn on their screen or has something they'd like to share. Um, we would be more than happy um, to, to, to have other folks. If, if, if you'd like to come on, you can raise your hand or just unmute yourself if you want to talk and share uh, or have any questions or, or any, any thoughts in response to this. Um, there is, a, 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 it's either Lucia or Lucia who said, who, who typically goes on your tours? Is it locals or tourists? Uh, it depends on the tour. Uh, the tunnel tours, which go under some of the buildings, uh, are mostly locals because people who've grown up in this area don't, haven't had the same experience with underground space as, um, say, New Yorkers who have maybe had a basement or been on the subway. Um, not necessarily true for those in the, in the Midwest. Um, so for the architecture tours, it's a mix of locals, but also a lot of people from out of town that are visiting. They heard Tulsa has Art Deco architecture, uh, which I've just showed you. And on the tour, I also go to some other buildings, including one that was built by the same man as the building you just saw, but three years earlier and the style is neo-Gothic. So it looks like a, uh, a cathedral inside. There's a fan vaulted ceiling that was made in Italy. And so it's interesting to see the different architectural styles, the neo-Gothic, the Beaux-Arts, um, and then transition to the, um, the Art Deco. So I do give a, uh, I think a, a pretty good architecture tour and uh, people from out of town tend to book that one. Cool, cool. Um, uh, to Peter, we have Peter here um, who did the cross country trip. Any, anything you'd like to share about your journey or re reaction to, to Jeffrey's kind of talk today? It was, it was really great. I mean, as somebody who's also gone across the country, I could relate to a lot of what you said. It was brought back a lot of great memories. Oh, that's that's well, that's really neat, and and thank you for sharing sharing your memories too. Um, well, we really appreciate that, um, and and would love to to see a chronicle of your adventures at some point. <laughs> um, so so thank you so much, everybody. We we have um, uh, we we're out of time essentially, um, and so Jeffrey, is there anything else you'd like to share? I mean, the the book is fantastic. Uh, I have it here with me. I, I finished it. Uh, just in the last few days uh, on my summer vacation and excellent, ex excellent, uh, really like a fun read that, that gives you hope for people like, oh, <laughs> like, it's a hopeful read, you know, positive perspective um, on your whole experience, uh, despite some of the challenges along the way. Um, and, uh, and so there's the book, uh, definitely check that out. Um, Country Bike, uh, if you want to go back and read some of the blog posts uh, that Jeffrey shared along the way. There's your Instagram, um, which people can follow at Country Bike and then also Tulsa Tours. So that's another way to follow you, check out your website. And um, Jeffrey, let's talk about doing some virtual uh, excursions out to some of the places where you lead tours. That sounds like a lot of fun. Sure, that would be wonderful. Thank you all for, for tuning in and spending your uh, lunch hour with me. I really appreciate it and uh, thanks again. All right. Thanks so much. And thanks so much to everybody who shared their stories. Um, and, uh, and we'll talk to you soon. Okay. Thank you. Have a great day. Thank you. Look forward to the book. Thank you. <laughs>